Welcome to the, the Islam Unraveled podcast and webinar. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. And this is uh, our honorable uh, Green Party uh, leader um, and MLA, Sonia Firstenau. So thank you so much for, for joining us. And what, what can I call you? I know there's uh, elected officials have certain titles and honorable. So just, just wanted to ensure that uh, I call you uh, the, 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 the formal uh, so please, please let me know what I can call you. Yeah, Sonia, please, would be the very best. <laughs> um, as an MLA, I don't get an honorable title. I'm, I'm just simply MLA or the member for Cowichan Valley. Uh, okay. It is uh, the, the cabinet ministers who get the uh, honorable. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much. So now the Green Party and um, your predecessor was Adrian May, correct? Uh, so... No, Adrian. Well, Adrian Carr is in the the city of Vancouver Greens. She's the leader of the of the city of Vancouver Greens, and then Elizabeth May is the federal leader. Um, I'm from Greens everywhere. <laughs> my, my, I was like, I mixed the names. My apologies. That's but, all right. But, but please tell us, like with the Green Party, I know uh, the Green Party has made headway, and uh, there there was a shared government for some time. Mm -hmm. So please talk about the foundation of the Green Party for those that. Uh, that uh, may not be aware of the, the kind of history of the Green Party and the, the mission of the Green Party, just as an overall history before mm -hmm. we get to your personal journey and, and, and your role with the Greens. Yeah, thanks so much. So, it, you know, the Green, the Green Party uh, parties have been around, uh, around the world uh, for decades and really came out of uh, a, a, a growing recognition that there has to be some political attention paid to issues around the environment and in particular climate change. Uh, and so there have been uh, successes, growing electoral success for Green parties in, in various places of the world. In Germany, in particular, the Greens have, had, uh, have made a lot of headway. Uh, New Zealand, Greens have been part of the coalition government in the, in the last government and in the current one, which is really interesting. In New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, the the current prime minister won a majority uh, under a uh, proportional representation election, but chose to put green members in her cabinet, uh, recognizing the value of those uh, perspectives that the Greens bring and had brought previously. Here in Canada, we have Greens elected in PEI, they are the official opposition. Uh, in New Brunswick, three Greens have been elected. Uh, in Ontario, we have a, a Green MLA, Mike Schreiner, and then of course federally, Elizabeth May has been elected since 2011, and we have three Green MPs, and here in BC, 2017, uh, three Greens were elected, we formed the balance of power, and now we are a caucus of two, Adam Olson and myself, uh, and delighted to be still working on behalf of our constituents and all of BC to bring, and this is really important, the, the thing that I think really sets us apart as a party uh, and sets Greens apart internationally is the focus on being evidence-based, on being uh, really recognizing the reality that we're in, but, but identifying the future that we would like to see, uh, and then looking for policies and legislation that will get us there and measuring that according to you know how does how does that move us towards the the vision we have for our province our country and for me i've, I've really tried to work on articulating that vision as the you know i've been leader since september um and and it comes down to four things for me which is uh, we are a province where everybody's needs are met and and people have what they need to thrive uh, we are a province where we take care of the natural systems that, that we depend on for our health and well-being, um, that our communities and our neighborhoods are, are vibrant and diverse and safe and resilient, and then that we have trust in our governments, in our electoral system, and in our institutions. And that's, a, that's for me, a, a, an articulation of a, a kind of a green, uh, but also my own vision for what I would like BC to be, and I think we can achieve that. Uh, but we have to be really clear on 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 what that means and and why we want to get there, and then how do we get there? 
And, and the environment, uh, obviously, being a very crucial um, uh, part of it, and with climate change and uh, uh, the previous uh, regime in the United States, uh, I was decided the, um, uh, uh, I don't know what the words to describe, but uh, they were not necessarily on the same page as the global community to, to combat climate change and to enact policies. And, and to follow through on policies, but it seems like um, uh, now uh, things are aligned, at least uh, in, in North America, uh, to, to really come together uh, from government uh, to address climate change, to enact policies, and to, to kind of, and what would you say are some metrics or some metrics of success or, or strategies we could uh, implement or that need to be to really address climate change? There, there's, there's much to be done and much that can be done. I, I tend to approach it really from uh, the level of community because I think that, that be, that's more understandable for us. Would, of course, we need to reduce our, our emissions. We need to ensure that we're transitioning away from a fossil fuel-based economy. We need to support workers in that transition. Uh, we need to develop an economy that's based on clean energy, on innovation, on on education uh, uh, and well-being. I, I think that this is what we, we have to put at the center of, of our economic thinking is the economy should actually be creating well-being for the people of the society. Um, in terms of, of specifically around climate change, you know, we, we look at some of the, the things that we could be doing in terms of transportation, we know on Vancouver Island, for example, uh, that emissions from transportation, the, the single largest sort of group of emissions we have. So uh, how do we how do we find ways to reduce those emissions? And I actually just had a meeting with a company that's looking at proposing electric, kind of small electric buses that would cross over between public transit and ride hailing. So you could, uh, you know, use an app and this little bus can come and get you, but it's also getting other people. So it's not as expensive as, as ride hailing. Uh, and it also kind of fills in that gap of public transportation of that sort of doorway to doorway piece that, that we would like to have. Agriculture is, a, is another area where we could be doing significant uh, uh, improvements and changes, protecting soil, ensuring that we're doing regenerative agriculture, which it would actually absorb enormous amounts of carbon and in, in, improve our food security, uh, which is so essential. Uh, our forestry practices need big changes. We are net emitters of carbon in our forests in British Columbia, which I think people would find quite surprising. You look at the landscape and it's covered in trees and you think that must be good for the climate. But in fact, uh, we are not um, managing our forests in a way that is climate friendly. Uh, so there, there's lots of work that can be done, but for me, it's really about that vision of could our, our communities be healthier, be, be more resilient, be more wonderful places to live through action on climate? And, and the answer to that is absolutely yes. And we've seen, we've seen some start of that uh, in cities and communities around BC and, and uh, you know, bike lanes as an example. I love hearing from families who say, you know, I, I would never ride my bike with my children, but now that there are protected bike lanes, we're riding all over the place. And you see these, these families and little children and medium-sized children and trailers and trailer bikes. And, 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 and to me, that, that gives me joy to see that uh, in, in the community. And I, and I think it, it's a joyful thing for people to be able to get around on bicycle or by foot or uh, inaccessible ways for people in wheelchairs. And, and that's an example of how do we recognize that national climate is actually a way to make our communities more wonderful places to be. And, and, and you, you mentioned a community from a community perspective and, and we, we kind of, um, were introduced in, in the context of the Muslim community and, you know, weighty topics like racism and mm -hmm. Islamophobia. And uh, with your background as a teacher and, and an educator and how um, education uh, in terms of how uh, people perceive the world and a lot of our education is now happening online 
with um, uh, people going to sources of, of uh, media and, uh, and sometimes a lot of the sources are inaccurate or fabricated or, or, or complete falsehoods about communities. And so uh, just, you know, from an educator standpoint, uh, dating myself, uh, uh, I, I, I went to school in the pre-internet days and uh, so didn't have social media. And maybe that was a good thing or a bad thing. But, uh, but, uh, but now um, in our work um, on, on racism and Islamophobia, mm-hmm. um, I, I, and naively, there was a time I didn't believe racism was going down. Uh, mm-hmm. Naively, I thought that, hey, you know what, it, that things are getting better. Uh, but because uh, people's uh, informal kind of, uh, and, and also with social media's algorithms, with, with the way they, they serve up uh, material to keep people engaged. So if I was to click on something that is um, kind of borderline racist, uh, the algorithms will start to serve up uh, more and more videos and content and suggestions that will take uh, me down a further rabbit hole, like like the flat Earth theory, or you know, uh, in the context the Muslims, Muslims are trying to implement Sharia law in Canada, or, or, or all, all kinds of insane conspiracy theories. And um, I, I'm currently reading a book on the history of Facebook, and they were talking about the 2016 election, uh, and they were saying that the the real news of, of, of actual, uh, actual news from the New York Times was shared uh, 10% of fake news and conspiracy stuff. So the, the conspiracy stuff and the more crazier, the better is what would get the millions and millions of views. Uh, whereas the actual logical, rational and actual news and actual real content didn't get as much shares and views. And so I know we're going to a, a bigger area of education mm-hmm. online but let's let's maybe start with your career uh, as an educator mm-hmm. and where you're seeing uh, uh, things trend in terms of uh, from a school setting but now to a general public consciousness through the way people are consuming information online yeah this is maybe the most important topic we have in our, in our current world because um, we can see the impact of misinformation, disinformation, racism online, hatred online, and the way that that is really such a corrosive force uh, in our world. So I'm gonna I'm gonna date myself too, and I'm gonna I'm a historian, so you're gonna get a little bit of a history uh, story from me. So I started at UVic in 1991 using the card catalogs at the time. Uh, so <laughs> way before internet, um, and I, I did my undergraduate degree in history and I had the, the incredible blessing to get a, a fellowship at the Center for Studies in Religion and Society when I was at UVic and I, I did my master's degree in medieval history and specifically 12th century theology <laughs> and, uh, um, the wonderful thing about the Center for Studies in Religion and Society was that we were in a, in a set of offices at UVic and every day at 10 o'clock, it was coffee time. So we would all come out of our offices and we'd all sit in the library and we would have coffee together. And this was the, the vision of the, the original founder of the center, um, Dr. Harold Coward. And, uh, that coffee time meant that as an undergraduate student at U, or as a graduate student, as a, a, a 20 something graduate student at UVic, I was spending my mornings with scholars from all around the world uh, who were studying various topics in religion and society. And that included Muslim scholars and Buddhist scholars and Christian scholars. And we had a community uh, and we learn from each other. And I developed a, a, a real deep curiosity and interest in uh, various religions and traditions and friendships uh, during those times. And I, I, I look back at my time at that center as, as a sort of glorious period of my life um, because I learned not only how to learn and write and research and I wrote my thesis and I, uh, 
I had these wonderful experiences, but I also learned what it was to be part of a, a community based on knowledge and curiosity and a kind of commitment to lifelong learning. That's what the internet does not provide. It does not provide community in that way. The community there is, is created, as you say, through algorithms, through pushing people uh, to certain corners, um, and, and the, it, it lacks human connection, and it lacks, importantly, it lacks teachers. And uh, we know that the, the important role that teachers play so then I, as a teacher, eventually I got my teaching degree and, and went on to teach in, in junior and in, in middle school and high schools. And, and the most important thing for me was creating a community in my classroom and, and that we as a classroom, as a group, were a, a connected, united community. And so when things came up, if there was bullying or if there was mistreatment or any kind of issues, we worked that out as a community. That's an important role that a teacher plays uh, in that you, you provide that kind of guidance and, and connection. And, and again, the information that comes at us through social media feeds and through the internet and through these uh, spaces that are, you know, peddling hatred and, and lies and, and misinformation, um, there's nobody there that is uh, in a teacher role saying, hold on. You know, you really have to have a critical view of what you're looking at or what this person is saying to you. And we know that the medium, particularly video, um, is very powerful. It, it, it hits us in different ways. It's not just our mind, uh, but it's our emotions uh, it, that are engaged and, and it can be a very powerful force. And again, don't have that connection with people who can say and see why that might you know lead you to thinking this way but what's important to understand is is this history or this context or these people or whatever it is and so I share with you a really deep concern about the way that um, the internet is uh, reinforcing racism uh, hatred, misunderstanding at the at the very least, um, and and undermining what is so essential, which is that that sense of community. And I, I really, you know, from my experience in my twenties, uh, the greatest antidote to um, racism and intolerance is is knowledge and learning and connection with other people and connection with people across a wide range of uh, backgrounds and, and cultures and religions. And you very soon and very quickly understand uh, there is way more that connects us, way more that we have in common that would ever, uh, that, than anything that, that is different about us. And the difference is, is what makes it interesting. And like you said, back in university, being able to hear from all these uh, these uh, uh, scholars and, and leaders in their respective uh, face, uh, we're like, wow, you know, a lot of the principles are very similar uh, mm -hmm. and the, the humanity. And I'll share with you what we did uh, with Islam Unraveled was we, we went to several synagogues and churches and, you know, the common refrain that we got was... Uh, a lot of people in the Jewish community and the Christian community, even though the synagogues and the churches were close to mosques, said we've never met Muslims before. Right. And so right off the bat, and then we did, so we called, we called it the interfaith exchange. So we would come as friends and neighbors to the services for the respective uh, place of worship uh, for the Jewish communities on Saturday. Christian community, of course, on Sundays, and for the Muslim community, it's Fridays. And so, and then we would uh, go there and break bread uh, with them. Uh, and then they would come to our mosque and, and, and there was some apprehension to come to the mosque and uh, what's going to happen. Maybe people are not going to like us and all that sort of concern. And we did also that with youth. So we did one with adults and then we did a youth exchange. And, and the, again, the same thing. Oh, we've never met Jewish people before, never met um, uh, Muslim people before on both sides. 
And after it was all said and done, it was like, oh, well, you know, when, when people meet one another, talk with one another and just be open about here, this is what I understand. And then we have a nice meal together afterwards. Uh, that does so much just with that engagement of sitting down, getting to know one another to, to bring people together. And we have uh, a friend of ours, his name is Rabbi Bregman. Uh, who is on the uh, Interfaith Council for the City of Vancouver, how we all connected to discuss ending homelessness in, 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 in Vancouver. And uh, so he launched something called Taste of Coexistence, which uh, before the pandemic was to, to bring in against faith leaders in the context of food diplomacy. My colleague Yusuf calls it uh, food diplomacy, where people get together, eat together, and, and get to know one another through through culinary uh, ways and and through open conversations and so just anecdotally as a sidebar that that's kind of how we've been trying to address uh, change uh, in a meaningful way uh, in person. Now, um, with yourself, you're you're in in government and and, and obviously change happens in government and in your role with the provincial government and and with the local government of of uh, of the island in in your role what what do you believe like in terms of uh, being an elected official uh, ways that we can improve or or possibly policies that need to be developed or enacted to improve uh, uh, race relations and and party group relations so i think that government has to play a, a really significant role in um, in ensuring that we are shifting from a society that has a, a great deal of systemic racism in our institutions uh, to a society that is anti-racist. And, and there is a lot um, that individuals can do to, to work on, on being anti-racist. And I think that that's a really important that it is an active, uh, an active proposal to, to choose to be anti-racism, it, it's work. Um, but that government plays this incredibly important role in ensuring that our systems and our institutions are not perpetuating racism. And we know that they are now. So where do we start? Uh, is with our, our institution and education, of course, I think is an essential starting place. So right from early childhood education, right through the to post-secondary, we need to have uh, anti-racism curriculum. We need to ensure that teachers are well-versed and, and capable of engaging with their students on anti-racism. But as you say, it's, it's really important that uh, it is humanized that, and, and as a teacher, this is the kind of thing I would absolutely do. Okay, we're going to have um, a Muslim person come into our classroom. We're going to have a Jewish person come into our classroom. We're going to have a black person come into our classroom. If we don't have the diversity in our classroom community, then we need to ensure that uh, our students and our, our classrooms are having experiences, meeting people from a, a wide range of communities and, and dismantling the fear that comes from a place of ignorance. Uh, because once the ignorance is dismantled, the fear goes away with it as well. Uh, you know, and, and when you talk about Islamophobia, the, the, the fear of Islam, as you say, uh, it doesn't take long to to recognize that there's there's nothing to be afraid of. And um, one of the other great joys of my undergraduate degree was studying a lot of Islamic art history uh, and, and learning uh, the history of Islam through, through the art and, and learning a great deal. And, and it was the opposite experience for me. I, I became, you know, very drawn to the beauty of Islamic art and the traditions and the history. And, and you know the 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 actions and the the mindfulness, the the, the prayers several times a day. I think that that's probably something that all of us should try to do is at least you know be mindful, meditate, pray several times a day. I, I you know this is a 
this is these are are wonderful traditions, and they 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 make a lot of sense when you understand them uh, from the people who are practicing. And so education is absolutely crucial and pivotal, and government has a very important role to play in ensuring that our education system is is actively anti-racist and is in, instead very pro-human, pro-connection, pro-community, pro-diversity. Uh, and, and I remember in, again in the 1970s, since we're dating ourselves today, um, when multiculturalism was brought into Canada. And I have these really warm and, and lovely memories of standing in a circle in our gymnasium, holding hands in a big circle and singing songs about multiculturalism. And, and, and that was very effective for a, a little child to be celebrating the idea that, you know, this is who we are as a country. We are multicultural and that's a good thing. Uh, and I think that we have to find ways to ensure that we're, we're you know, continuing to work on that. Our health system, as we saw from the report from Mary Ellen Dupella Fond, has a long ways to go in addressing embedded and systemic racism and the discrimination that Indigenous people, Black people and people of colour experience in our healthcare system is something that should be uh, distressing to each and every one of us. And, and we need to ensure that, uh, that, that steps are taken, that, that education happens, that, uh, that, that again, addressing that, the, the biases that exist to, to make that uh, a reality for far too many people, our justice system, uh, our policing system, and I'm very uh, proud of my colleague, Adam Olson, who's the MLA for Saanich North and the Islands. He's on the Police Act Review Committee and, and doing incredible work and taking that job very seriously, a lot of research, a lot of work with uh, community, um, because we know that our policing system has racism built into it. Um, I read a piece in the Globe and Mail on Friday, on Saturday, about the experience of uh, being a black man driving in Vancouver, and what it what it means to um, be targeted, really, to be pulled over, uh, to be treated differently. And then I had my 15 year old son read the whole piece. I said, "You need to read this. You need to understand, you know, the difference between." how you experience the world as a, a white teenage boy and how the world is experienced by a, a non-white, a black teenage boy or a, a boy of color. And, you know, I think that that's, that's work that we all have to do. We all have to work on understanding that the way that we experience the world is not the same uh, for everybody. Uh, our child welfare system, this is work that I've been very engaged in since 2017. Um, we have a devastating overrepresentation of Indigenous children in our child welfare system. Uh, up to 70% of children uh, who are in care are Indigenous right now. And that is, uh, again, just a shocking and brutalizing statistic. And when we, we understand the trauma, the intergenerational trauma that Indigenous people have suffered uh, in Canada, and that that trauma has been uh, so deeply um, executed in the removal of children from family and community, and that it continues to this day, uh, again, is something that everybody in BC, uh, everybody in Canada should be alarmed by and committed to seeing change. So that's just a, a handful of, of government institutions that need reform, that need systemic change because they are perpetuating systemic racism. And, you know, it's not enough to say, oh yes, we, we you know, there's racism or there's systemic racism. We have to be actively looking at how are we changing that? How are we changing it urgently? Um, because it harms all of us. You know, racism isn't something that it, it only harms people who experience it. It harms our whole society. It harms our communities. It harms everybody. And uh, to me, it is one of the most urgent issues that we have to work on 
in our government and and we are deeply committed to continuing to work on it and, and like you said community so community it involves so many facets education is one and uh, and uh, addressing systemic and and, and anti-racist so um in this study that uh, that we've been doing with Islam and Ravel in the Muslim community about extremism and, and even white nationalism and and so a common thread for extremism and and violence is uh, is uh, some of these uh, people that that become violent uh, they have a history of, of being bullied or mental health issues and so bullying in a school setting in in elementary school or high school or, or university so being bullied by one's peers or uh, the educator themselves may have a, a bias or a prejudice against that uh, race or, or religion and so it comes in in, in two fronts from from the, the peers as well as possibly uh, the person in position of authority uh, uh, being uh, prejudiced uh, against uh, the color of the skin or, or the religion itself and so because it is a community issue which has so many layers and so many uh, uh, effects um, uh, based on this systemic aspect where we're again uh, attitudes and biases are, are informed in a school setting um, let, let's maybe talk about possible solutions that you may have seen as an educator uh, to to improve race relations and, and, and you know, religious minorities and the perception of them in, in the school context, because bullying and mental health, I think a lot of that uh, uh, problems occur during those formative years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that um you know, our our classrooms and our school settings are so important in, in establishing how we interact with each other, right? And so the most important course I ever took as a, and when I was in, doing my education degree was how to create a pro-social environment in your classroom. And I'd never heard of this term pro-social, but it's the opposite of anti-social. And, uh, and the woman who taught it had uh, an enormous amount of experience and, and personal stories and anecdotes about her classrooms and, and how she created this environment of uh, a, a pro-social environment. And for me, I really translated that as how do you create a community in your classroom? And I know I keep coming back to this word, but it means a lot to me. I think it is the antidote to, to so much of what we struggle with is, is that sense of connected community. So um, as a teacher, it is, it, to me, the, 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 the greatest responsibility that I had was ensuring that my classroom was safe for everybody, that there was no bullying or uh, violence, whether it was physical or verbal violence happening in my classroom. And on the occasion that that did happen, then it was everybody in a circle and how are, we, how are we dealing with this? How are we solving this? What is the problem with this? Because I think one of the problems we have with how we handle bullying in the classroom is we, we, we maybe just take out the, the, the bully and the victim and we separate them and we, you know, we, we talk to them or we say, you know, this, this can't go on. Instead of saying, actually, it's everybody in the whole classroom. It's everybody in the whole school that has a responsibility to make this a safe place. Um, and, and so we, again, we, we remove that notion that it's just individuals as opposed to the, the wider community. And, I, and then if that can translate out to our whole province, it's, it's on all of us to ensure that our communities and our towns and our cities are safe for everybody. And so when we see behaviors or we see actions online or in, in the real world, uh, that constitute violence or bullying or discrimination or racism or hate, what's our collective responsibility to address them? And how do, we, how do we do that? And I think if we can learn that in our classrooms, if we can learn that in our schools about, you know, it is my business when I see one, one child bullying another or somebody being discriminated against because of their race or their religion, 
I, I have a role to play in this that is very important. That's what we need to embed in our education system. And, and the, as you said, community is the crux of it because as a community, and, and again, with all faiths is about the care for the neighbor. And, and part of our, our work became because of that, if our neighbors are thinking a certain way, it's our kind of duty to sit with them, talk with them and, 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 and share with them. And, uh, and again, it's multi-layered because community is government, community is law enforcement, community is educators, community is a, a peer group of, 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 of various uh, uh, ethnic groups and religious groups. Now, in terms of of um, the policies now in 2021, and with the provincial government and uh, anti-racism uh, programs, I, I know there's a there there's now with the parliamentary secretary of um, of uh, anti-racism mm -hmm. uh, that 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 portfolio has been put forth, and uh, and. Even because the needs of racialized and religious minorities are, are very similar. So part of uh, what our objective is, is also if we're interested in helping uh, protect the Muslim community from Islamophobia, then it's fair to work with the Black community that also suffers the similar issues for the First Nations community, or now with the Asian community, the people that are, are from China or Asian countries that are getting discriminated against because of the coronavirus, and 800% increase in attacks on people that look Asian that are being blamed for the coronavirus. So with all of our groups facing different types of uh, racial attacks motivated by different things, but more or less we're trying to engage, uh, respectively, uh, re representing our uh, our uh, specific uh, identity, uh, but also to work with these other groups because uh, united um, uh, and with allyship, with with again uh, people like yourself in government, uh, that we all have these same values that uh, that the community should get along, the community should be happy, the community uh, uh, needs to have a brotherhood and sisterhood. And instead of all our, our objectives being siloed, that how we can all work together with the other racialized and uh, discriminated against communities in, in a unified fashion, uh, along with government. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and it, in some ways, it, this intersects a little bit with my, my um, thoughts around climate change. Um, because I think what we need to do in, and, and if you look at Texas as, you know, an example, they've just gone through this absolutely terrible uh, storm. They lost power for several days. Uh, the, uh, the suffering has been absolutely immense. And I, you know, I can't even imagine. But the reality is climate change is going to bring more and more of these kinds of uh, disruptions to our lives. We're, we're gonna, you know, a couple of years ago, we had the storms on uh, Southern Vancouver Island and, and there were parts of uh, the Gulf Islands and um, Vancouver Island that didn't have electricity over the entire uh, winter break, right? So right from a week before Christmas to New Year's, uh, houses went without power and in very cold circumstances. So I, I thought about this at length and I thought, okay, so on the one hand, because of climate change, we have to become more resilient. We have to create uh, preparedness, emergency preparedness. How do we connect emergency preparedness with this community building and ultimately a kind of social resilience that we also need to create? Because in times of emergency, we need our neighbors more than ever. And we have to rely on each other. To, to get through really difficult times. And so I've actually created this whole chart, I call it the neighborhood captains. And with the idea that we create little, and I know that this is happening in a lot of communities around BC already. And I, I just think that there's a role government can play in kind of ensuring that it happens widely. You, you'd have a captain, a neighborhood captain, and, and you'd have say 20 households or 30 households. and everybody gets to know each other, 
And as part of emergency preparedness, you do a kind of inventory of, okay, who has uh, generators, who has wind stoves, who has, uh, you know, what we need landlines if we lose power, th these kinds of things, right? Um, but to, to embed that emergency preparedness in community building resilience, you say, okay, four times a year, we're all going to gather, you know, and I can't wait for COVID to be over because I, I really think we all need to gather again, but we're going to have, a, you know, a big community, a neighborhood potluck or a street party, or we're going to have events where we just all get to see each other and look each other in the eyes and know each other. And then we're going to buddy up houses. So it, I just think on our street, we have some elderly people that, that live near us and, and the little cluster of houses, we all, in an emergency, we had a snowfall a couple weeks ago. Okay, who's checking on Fred? Who's checking on Erica? Is everybody okay? Do the, our kids went and dug out driveways and, and that kind of thing. And that's, that's a kind of um, connectivity that we need to be seeing wisely. And then once we've established that, just that basic level, we all know each other, we, we can take it further. Well, well who has skills that, that would be good to share? So I would love to have a, a master gardener help me, you know, improve my kale output in my garden. Or if somebody wants to learn how to knit, uh, I, can, I can give knitting lessons. Um, if the, the folks that have the alpacas down the way uh, have nowhere for their wool to go, I actually have a, a wheel and I can spin that wool and, and then we can share that wool out. You know, I, I, it, it sounds very homey and I, I am in a semi-rural area, um, but I think that this can work in, in any neighborhood. And, and then we've, we've created not only uh, a, a depth of emergency preparedness, but in doing so, we've created a deeper social resiliency and a fabric that, that holds our neighborhoods together in ways that um, I think is, is absolutely essential. And it's really hard to be afraid of Muslim people or Sikh people or people from Syria or Black people when they are your neighbors and you have, as you say, broken bread with them and they are your friends. That, that fear and, and that, that ignorance goes away. And um, maybe I'm, you know, uh, maybe I'm naive, but I, I really think that this is what uh, it comes down to is we have to thread back together our neighborhoods uh, in ways that really break down any, any divisions that are, are truly based only on a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding. Oh, you're muted. My apologies. Uh, I, this community building and community strengthening, uh, because now with so much social media and even with our kids, uh, even at a dinner table or at a family gathering, uh, a lot of people just go to their phones and, and that human interaction is not uh, the same as it was without the phones and, and, and without this so much like hundreds of thousands of choices of shows and, and mm -hmm. see them. So it, you're right, building the, the community relationships and the neighbors um, here uh, I agree with you that, that that is really because fundamentally we live in an area like when we do do our outreaches, we are going to, to not necessarily immediately local places, but but with the neighbors themselves, uh, because I think people are, are desirous of community and mental health and addiction is exacerbated when people feel alone, when they mm -hmm. feel connected. And, and by knowing that, hey, my neighbor is there with, with that smile, with, uh, you know, uh, to, to really feel like I know my neighbors. And, uh, and I think uh, we do have Mother's Day, Father's Day, we have uh, Family Day, but uh, I, I don't think we have a Neighbor's Day or a Community Day, something that says, hey, we're a community. We are Canadians. We're British Columbians. We're 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 from our respective cities. But but the community needs to be celebrated because, in essence, uh, we may see our extended family from time to time on a few occasions. 
uh, throughout the year, but our neighbors are there day in, day out, uh, every night when we come back. And, and that might be worth uh, celebrating as, as a community and, uh, and how communities can get together specifically because we are neighbors. And I think every faith shares that. Take care of your neighbor. Take care of your neighbor is, is a fundamental uh, value that, that all faiths espouse. And so I think uh, you're onto something. And I think if, if it could be even formalized, uh, because really uh, the neighbors, uh, the strength of the neighbors helps the mental well being, uh, the emotional well being, perhaps protection against racism or, or discrimination in the community. And in the event of an emergency, to come together that, hey, we've got to combat this uh, horrific weather event or, or whatever could happen. And, and th there is something there that uh, like in our faith, uh, in, 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 we're responsible for our neighbors 40 days to the 40, 40 houses to the, the East, the West, the North and the South. So I'm like thinking to myself, I've got to connect with 40, 80, 120, 160 homes uh, in my surrounding areas as, as a responsibility. And, and I, I will say I haven't done that per se. I do know a couple of my immediate neighbors, but that really involved a, a way to to connect with m many more neighbors on the street. I think that that is worthy of, of uh, trying to come up with a way to, to formalize that, make that something that the, the government could get behind. Mm -hmm. Yep, I, I, I know it's, for example, Powell River has, uh, they've actually implemented some of this. And so they, the, the local government will provide funds for uh, neighborhoods to host, uh, you know, community neighborhood street parties, and they'll provide funds to kind of uh, put these, these initiatives into place. Uh, so I know that there are pockets of uh, governments, uh, the Kootenays is also looking at this. I think what we'd like to see is um, the provincial government recognize it has a, a role to play in supporting in supporting this kind of initiative and um, as you say uh, mental health connection is 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 the antidote to uh, that feeling of loneliness and disconnection that is at the source of, of uh, so many issues and and you can also see it like Oh, if you if you know your neighborhood, you might find out that if you're in need of childcare, well, there's somebody that is available, and and it can be your neighbor, or you you and your neighbor down the street, you actually go to the same location uh, every day at the same time, and you can start to car share. Um, and I know that you know all of this sounds like a glorious dream in the time of COVID, but maybe COVID is going to deliver us some very profound lessons about the place that connection really does hold in our beings and in ourselves, because we have now had to go for so long without those kinds of happenstance and everyday connections that, that typically happen as you're going through your day. Uh, we've, we've, we've gone so long now without having people in our homes. I was saying to my friend the other day, I just miss having people over for dinner. You know, the, the conversations that happen over the course of a, a whole dinner are so rich and so wonderful. And I, I really miss them. And even this, you know, even having this opportunity to have a longer conversation with you, I'm, I'm so uh, nourished and heartened uh, by the opportunity. But so COVID, is, is, is helping us recognize that crucial place that connection with other people plays in our lives. And so maybe out of it, we will have this, uh, this, this time and this, this opportunity, maybe a bit of a hunger to say, I wanna, I wanna create connection in my neighborhood. I wanna come out of this and be more deeply connected uh, once we're we're all safely vaccinated and can carry on because that connection is the thing that was the greatest loss over this last year. 
Absolutely. And, and I, I wanted to thank you for taking your time out because, you know, we could meet at certain events and because of everyone's schedule, it's a five minute hello, just a, a few pleasantries. And then, you know, everyone has their respective things to do. And, and in this format, uh, not only for myself, but, but for, for those that are listening, that, that uh, to really richly understand each other's point of view and background and, and uh, ideas. Uh, I think the, this format, uh, in my view, helps uh, a greater understanding. And part of what I want to do uh, as part of our community is, is uh, kind of share the stories with, with allies that we have within uh, government that, uh, that, hey, we are working together. Um, it, there, there was a recent attack on, on, a, on a Muslim woman um, uh, in Edmonton. And, and these are things that are happening. And, and we, we just, you know, instead of us just, uh, you know, uh, hearing it and saying, oh, that's terrible, but, but by being able to speak with those of you that are in government that have an ability to say, hey, this is not acceptable, mm -hmm. that we can hear that, you know, these are things happening and immediately have it come to legislators that uh, it's continually happening. We need to, to, to come together on multiple fronts to address this, this issue. And, and in, in actually, you, you, your, your team did uh, refer us to your colleague, um, uh, Emily Adam Olson, uh, who's also uh, part of the First Nations and, and part of the First Nations community, one of the first First Nations people elected in in uh, in government. And in a similar way, there are some aspirations from our Muslim community to to run in government and to become elected members of the Green Party, like Mehreen and uh, and others, uh, to to be part of the 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 the, the legislative process. Uh, to speak not not only as an ally to but to be at the table as somebody from that community to represent uh, the voice there at the table and so just with Adam's experience and perhaps Mehreen and and the overall mandate of inclusivity for the BC Greens perhaps we could maybe obviously you're you're looking at the bigger tent that we are a community that represents multiple colors multiple beliefs and multiple backgrounds and to bring that together as part of the platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm delighted that Marine is running in the uh, City of Burnaby by-election and I, I'm, I'm so excited to see that news the other day and I wish her all the very best. I, I'm, I'm fingers crossed and uh, she was a, a fantastic candidate in the 2020 election. I really enjoyed uh, getting to know her and, and meeting with her. Um, and this is absolutely what we need. We need the diversity, the range of uh, backgrounds and, and religions and races at the decision-making table because without it, we lack absolutely essential perspectives on the decisions that we're making, the impacts those decisions have, uh, and the, the reasons why we need to be, you know, in, in a lot of cases, making different decisions. And I think of, you know, you look at, I just walked down the hallway when I come to my office in the legislature, I walked down the hallway of premiers uh, in BC. And uh, with a few exceptions, uh, very few exceptions, that is a long hallway of white men of a certain age. Yeah, of a certain age, yes, exactly. You know, it's not even not even diversity in age. I mean, it is it is all sort of the the fifty to seventy set. There you go. That's what you get. Um, and of course, that's a they come with a, a an experience of life, a worldview, and a perspective that is limited to um, what they have, and and it's not their fault necessarily. Uh, but you know, the fact that we've only had the ability for women to vote for just over a hundred years in BC, uh, and over the whole space of that hundred years, I think we're we're somewhere in the range of 120 women total have been elected in BC. Uh, you know, we we have a, a long history of not diversity in our representation in in BC and in Canada, and the. The more diversity we have, the better we are at, at uh, making decisions that reflect 
the whole province and reflect the perspectives. The, those decisions are exponentially better. Uh, I think about, you know, last, I think it was last year, 2019, um, the caucuses all work together in this motion brought by Rashna Singh that allows for MLAs to wear head coverings inside the chamber because previous it was written in the standing orders that you shall not, you know, wear your head covering for, because for that long line of men of a certain age, a head covering was just a hat, right? And no, no expectation that a head covering could have any significance other than that. And it was wonderful the way that the all MLAs in the chamber unanimously supported this motion. Um, we spoke to it from all three parties as a celebration of uh, um, a maturing of politics and political representation in BC. We have a long ways to go, a long ways to go. Um, and we cannot at any time be passive about the work that needs to be done. And from, from inside the, the BC Green Party, I'm deeply committed to this work. Um, we are working on ensuring that we have uh, ongoing cultural safety uh, education, and we are working with a, a number of communities. In fact, uh, right after this, I'm, I'm going to a, a meeting with uh, the, the group here in, in Victoria that's been pushing for the recognition of the International Decade of, for People of African Descent to be formally recognized uh, by the provincial government. And we've been working with them for over a year, I think now, coming up to a year. Uh, and we're gonna continue on that. So that, you know, internally, uh, we, we recognize that our work has to be uh, reflecting the goals that we have for the province. And we have to have that. I'm very excited about the slate of people running for our provincial council. Uh, definitely the most diverse slate of provincial council candidates the BC Greens has ever had. And I'm, I'm fiercely um, proud and excited to see this shift happening in our party. And I look forward to it continuing. And conversations like this one uh, are so enriching and so important and so essential. Uh, and I hope that we will continue to have them. And again, in the after COVID, I'm, I'm coming your way. <laughs> no, to receive you. We're looking forward to, to meet up with you. And, and as you said, like Canada is, is, is a great country and our province is a great province. And, and the, 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 the willingness that we're all trying to work towards these solutions, because we are seeing, you know, diversity being, being represented worldwide with, uh, you know, great leaders like Angela Merkel and, uh, and Jacinda Ardern and now Kamala Harris and, and, all, and, and Sadiq Khan in London, like roles that uh, historically were, 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 as you said, men of a certain age and, and race are now uh, changing. And, and here in, in British Columbia and Canada uh, with the great work and leadership uh, under yourself and your team. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing more of that diverse change. And I, I really enjoyed uh, this conversation as well as uh, lengthy conversations with Mahreen and uh, Adam. Uh, I really, really, really enjoy your, your the, the kind of psychology and positivity of your team. So thank you so much, uh, Sonia. I really appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to meeting you uh, once uh, the pandemic uh, kind of abates and, and we're all able to get together. Thank you for joining us and sharing your, your knowledge with us. Thank you so much for this opportunity and for this wonderful conversation. And, and I'm, I, it, yeah, there could have been no better way to start the day. I've really, really enjoyed it. And I can't wait to see you again and uh, continue the conversation. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye now. Thank you.